Well, as with most good historic recipes for cookies, there's a lot of butter, a lot of sugar, and a lot of flour in this recipe. But one thing that might separate it from any cookie recipe that I've ever attempted is the addition of literal wine. And I just have Malbec for this recipe, but it doesn't specify, so you could probably use a white wine and the cookies will come out lighter. We're gonna get started with a literal pound of flour. And I'm using my scale because I just am astounded that it's telling us to use a pound of flour. It's been very specific, which if you know anything about 19th century recipes, sometimes, especially early in the 19th century, that doesn't happen. And quite specifically, once again, we're going to add a half a pound of butter or two sticks and I'm going to take these and cut them up before we add them. Next, we're going to add the spice and the sugar and quote the caraways, which is really just more spice. I am going to add three tablespoons, again, quite specific, very happy with that, of caraway seed. This is ground, just because I don't want seeds in my teeth, but, you know, same idea. Does the exact same thing. Oh, it smells really spicy already, and there's so much spice that goes in this. Now, thank you very much to the users who told me the best method of using a towel to sit my silicone chopping board on top of a wet towel because I have to say, I had never done that before. I don't really like silicone, but that's what we have right now. It has made things a ton easier. I've done this a number of times now and it's kind of changed my life. Now, y'all know that in the Christmas cake, there is the whole outer shell, or at least most of one, of this beautiful nutmeg. But this recipe takes it to new heights because we're going to put an entire grated nutmeg into this recipe, as though the caraway and the other spices weren't enough. So I'm gonna grate this whole nutmeg. Don't tell the Brit in the household, but we're putting in a teaspoon of cinnamon. And then as though an entire nutmeg wasn't enough, we are also going to include a teaspoon of mace, which is the outside of the nutmeg, so. So now comes the fun part, and that is I am to add the liquor, as it says, which this again is just Malbec, and in varying degrees, stir it with a knife. And before I forget, when it says liquor, what it really means is all the wet ingredients. And the other wet ingredient in an AP is rose water. Now I have rose extract, so I'm going to make a rose water out of it, but I also don't know how much I like the idea of just having rose extract. I want these to be kind of Christmassy tasting. So I'm also going to use a little bit of orange extract to make like orange blossom water. Essentially, we're only adding as much liquid as we absolutely need. It does say that if the wine isn't enough, a glass, quote unquote, which I've got eight ounces here, then we can add additional cold water to make, quote, a stiff dough. But it needs to be a dough that's malleable and also shapeable as opposed to liquid. That dough, while scraggly, came together much more quickly than I imagined, and I didn't even have to use the entire glass of wine, which means that hopefully adding those extracts are not going to make it too wet. I'm also going to, because we of course have modern refrigeration, use that extra step that is not included in the recipe of putting the dough in the refrigerator for half an hour so that the butter gets nice and cold, and therefore will help the cookies 
maintain their shape a bit longer. So I'm just gonna cut this in half right here. And it's a very sticky dough already. I'm really pleased with this. I can't believe there are no eggs in it. So the conversion of rose water to extract is one and a half parts to two parts. So in this case, essentially without doing all of the math on camera for you, we're putting in a teaspoon and a half of extract into each of these different parts of the dough. So now while the cookies are in the refrigerator waiting on their baking, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of these fascinating cookies called APs. So cookies are one of the oldest human pleasures, in terms of cooking at least, with the earliest cookies probably being made over 10,000 years ago in the Fertile Crescent and then spreading across the Muslim world and then into Europe. And then cookies were brought to Spain by the Moors probably in around the 1600s, but it could have been as early as 717 when they invaded Spain and took over for a while. Cookies have a very storied history as biscuits because that's what people in Europe in English at least, call cookies. And they were brought over and established in the United States with the colonies, and then basically evolved from there. So what we're talking about when we're talking about the history of APs is a further development of the cookie as a recipe. And you can look at the history of the AP to realize just how far cookies developed in the 18th and the 19th centuries. So by the 19th century, we were starting to experiment with more flavors. Gingerbread had always been kind of the go-to for cookies because it was easy to make. You don't have to regulate the temperature as much with gingerbread. But then when ovens continued to develop throughout the Victorian era into the Edwardian period in the early 1900s, with that development came more and more interesting variations of cookie recipes. And the AP recipe is no different. So when we're talking about the AP, then we're talking about cookie history. Now, let's talk about the AP itself, because the AP is a really interesting recipe that I had never heard of before, and what, what it was, was essentially a cookie that was made out of wine and basic refined goods, like flour and, you know, sugar, all of the things that make cookies good, except for eggs, interestingly enough, but it seems like you don't need them. However, that said, when you start to look at the variations of the AP, then the wine gets replaced with eggs and there's more of an emphasis on milk and other dairy products as we get into later in the 19th century and into the 20th century. Now the AP itself was brought probably from Germany and was very, very popular and supposedly still continues to be popular by the Pennsylvania Dutch community. And specifically in Philadelphia, it was a very popular treat with children and bakers would sell them on the streets throughout the colonial period in the United States history. The first time we see the recipe in a cookbook is in 1828 in the book 75 Recipes for Pastries, Cakes, and Sweetmeats by Eliza Leslie. And I have linked that book in the description if you want to find a facsimile of it. It is very interesting stuff. It's a little less difficult to read than Amelia Simmons, but it's sort of along the same lines since it's an early cookbook from the United States. But it has a recipe, the one that I'm using today, that calls for wine and lots and lots of spices. Despite the fact that they came from Germany and were called anise platchen because they were made from star anise, popular conjecture dictated that the reason why these stamped cookies had an A and a P on them is because of a baker called Anne Page who used to sell the cookies and essentially helped spread their popularity across Philadelphia. Since that's been debunked, then now we just know that Ann Page 
did make these cookies and popularized them quite a lot, but she was probably not the inventor of the AP cookie as we know it today, if we do in fact know it today. So make sure that you tell me in the comments below, if you are from Pennsylvania, have you ever had an AP? Do you like them? And where do you get them? Because I couldn't find any commercial APs, but that doesn't mean that they're not still made because there are recipes from the 20th century for AP cookies that still exist and obviously must have been used by someone. So if someone in your family enjoys AP cookies, or if you do, please comment below and let me know. Now it's time to shape the cookies and put them in the oven. Refrigerated and it's ready to be shaped. And instead of cutting these out because the original recipe wants you to essentially roll them out and then place them. I already have my pans here and I am going to use these little snowflake cookie presses since I do not have an AP press to shape the cookies. And here we have it. We have our finished AP cookies, and they're actually really cute. So over the last day or so, I have done a lot of variations on how to maybe finish these guys, and I did say it, I said these guys. So in the end, even though I did a lot of experimentation on it, I would say that if you're going to attempt to make these, just having them plain is probably best. So these AP cookies, I have two different versions of them, again, one of the versions is the original version, and then the newer versions that I just kind of did a variation on with the orange blossom water instead. I had never really smelled anything like it before, except maybe mold wine, but still not quite mold wine. There was a brightness to it. It doesn't exist in mold wine, and I'm just really surprised that we don't have some variation of these cookies that people still celebrate with en masse. Again, you're gonna start with the rose water ones. It's rose water, okay. This so is the rose water. Smelling it for, oh goodness. Smells, smells interestingly like um, soap. <laughs> so the modern depiction of rose water in food is typically that a lot of people are turned off by it because of the soap factor. But personally, I'm not sure that I've ever understood that because we have lemon and lime smelling soaps that we use in kitchens and in bathrooms, but we still enjoy lemon and lime sodas and we still enjoy lemon cakes and cookies and nobody bats an eyelid. So the, the undue hate for rose water is confusing to me. I can get on board with that. So do I eat it or clean myself with it? <laughs> Go ahead and eat it. Okay. Hmm. So unlike the kind of lemon flavored drinks you were just talking about, this one also tastes like soap, <laughs> but it's not bad. I mean, I'd eat it again. Do you get any of the taste of the wine in there? I mean, it's minimal. Hopefully the alcoholic content still seeps into my blood so that I'm brave enough to finish this. Yeah, no, that's not the way that baking with alcohol works. This is my modern variation on the APs. And instead of rose water, it has orange blossom water. Okay, that's promising, I think, because I've, I've not usually had many soaps that taste like orange, so hopefully this steers me away from soap. Hmm. Yeah, that's a better one. <laughs> yeah, I like that. It still has the underlying notes of the mulled wine and the spices, but the brightness has changed, and of course it's made it much more orangey as opposed to rosy. The book is linked below. And if you decide to try these, you can absolutely switch out the rose water for orange blossom water or rose extract for orange extract, which is what I did. And it's still gonna taste 
less like soap apparently. <laughs> so we're going to enjoy at least the orange APs now. And don't forget to tell me in the comments below, if you live in Pennsylvania, do you enjoy APs? Have you ever made them? And have you ever encountered this recipe? I'm really curious to know in the comments. And in the meantime, we are almost to our thousand dollar goal. So if you would like to go to Make-A-Wish Foundation and make your own donation, even if it's just a dollar, it'll go a long way toward making some children's lives that much more magical during the holiday season. Until tomorrow, when we both see you for another Vlogmas video. Cheers. Cheers.